Okay, so hi everyone again. We will continue with what uh, Mr. Turnheim uh, started. I'm Sophia, and according to this, Ant uh, Antonia and Burch. And uh, let us begin with a short summary. Here's a short outline, but you will be able to keep up while we are talking. So uh, uh, to begin with, we wanted to tell the destabilization of existing s systems. It is like an emerging research and policy concern related to social technological transitions. And it is like this kind of issue that is getting more and more of awareness since it's uh, tied to techno-optimistic -opti discourse of course being under pressure and thus we wanted to talk about like also the social cost of regional decline in technological races like for instance we wanted to tell that there are some limits of innovation like where this races for uh, growth can lead about fundamental system change and how it is needed and like yet that uh, it's not that easy to make it sustainable and uh, also about like how do we study technology beyond innovation and over uh, arcing role of transition and uh, we wanted to give you a grasp of main definitions again, which are to, uh, first social technological destabilization. And as it was already emphasized, the important word here is a longitudinal process and like by which otherwise relatively stable and coherent social, uh, social technological forms, they become exposed to challenges significant enough to threaten their continued existence and their normal functioning. Then the, the, the next definition is system decline. And uh, speaking easily, it means, it means a degradation of system performance, which can lead to total decline and phase out, which refers to deliberate intervention seeking the partial or total discontinuation of a social uh, technical form that is deemed undesirable. And we also wanted to uh, present you like a super conceptual framework of destabilization. And here we uh, mentioned three core mechanisms themselves folded into three dimensions, like as it was mentioned already, like techno, economic, institutional, and re relational ones. To begin with, we wanted to uh, talk about external pressures for uh, change exerted on systems and like here, we wanted to emphasize, like here you can read, but that pressures can be built up over time and the interaction of multiple pressures influences the type of pressure fr uh, fronts observed, which may be more or less challenging. And regarding strategic responses to those pressures by actors within the system, here it's like an emphasis on how these actors might, response and how, uh, might respond and how do they react to destabilization. Like uh, also these strategic responses to external challenges, they can also differ significantly according According to like these individuals and like the diversification of these atoms and like search for alternative paths in general. Thus, uh, talking about destabilization, we wanted to tell that there are also many considerations. For instance, such as temporal issues, for instance, for how long these processes can last, with what speed should they be implemented, and in what timing, and uh, how like the stabilization decline phase out vary significant, significantly across sectors, because all uh, of such uh, processes, they have their different specifications, even ge uh, geographically as well. Also, we mentioned uh, about phase out decisions as considerations, since timing also depends uh, on factors like economic viability and so on, and about relation of destabilization and innovation that established systems tend to prevent innovation. Thus, our main takeaway, uh, takeaways are that transitions in general are very complex and it's difficult to find one solution and follow it step by step because reality is uh, much more uh, difficult in practice. Also the fact that uh, decline uh, will affect harm people because if we change some systems, many people can lose jobs. For instance, if we uh, diminish the, like as it was mentioned with 
cramped system, then all people who were working in this sphere, they would lose jobs, and also that not many politicians are eager to take the risk and responsibility mm -hmm. on taking on a new system, since they can lose their popularity in this way. And now, passing to Borj. Okay, yeah, and now I'm going to talk about a case study uh, in order to exemplify the destabilization yeah. framework. And the case study is about the destabilization of uh, electricity industry in Germany. And uh, like in the end of the 20th century, electricity was mainly produced uh, by fossil fuels and nuclear power plants in Germany. And uh, together with this destabilization process, the phase out plan of uh, nuclear power plants was introduced and the uh, share of renewables in electricity production increased to 30 percent uh, by 2015. So I'm going to explain the process through the three uh, major dimensions of the destabilization framework, which are namely external pressures for change, yeah. strategic responses from the incumbent system, and changing commitments to reproductive activities. Yeah, firstly, the incumbent system was exposed to many different uh, pressures coming from different sources and these uh, pressures mainly uh, questions the legitimacy, uh, the functionality and the relevance of the incumbent system. Uh, one of the pressures is the strong public opinion against nuclear energy. I mean, although it, it was a very complicated discussion, mainly people were against nuclear energy because uh, it was regarded unsafe and very risky. And uh, other than that, there were two major global crises, which also put uh, pressure on the incumbent system. The 2008 financial crisis uh, decreased the consumption of electricity and thereby uh, reduced the profits of the electricity utilities. And then the 2011 Fukushima accident, um, like uh, it's affected the negative ideas of people against nuclear power plants even further. And uh, together with these developments, uh, several regula regulations uh, were put into action, uh, which mainly uh, aim to restrict the uh, operations of the nuclear power plants, either by um, like putting the phase-out plants or restricting the, and limiting their uh, timelines. And some other regulations also try to promote the um, operations of the renewable power plants and renewable energy. So together with these regulations, uh, renewable energy uh, co co continuously uh, increased and it appeared as a uh, threat and as an alternative to the incumbent system. And together with these pressures, uh, the incumbent system gave several responses in order to protect its position and one of these uh, responses is the lobbying efforts of the incumbent actors. So basically incumbent actors use their uh, political power in order to intervene with uh, legislative, legislative processes to stop the phasing out process of nuclear power plants and the, or uh, extend their lifetimes. And other than that, these incumbent actors proposed some incremental changes against climate change uh, within the industry, which are namely efficiency increase in conventional power plants or uh, carbon capture uh, storage technologies. Uh, these incremental changes were favored over a more uh, radical transition, such as the renewable transition, because uh, they, they would be much more uh, destructive for their uh, authority in the, uh, incum in the incum incumbent socio-technical system. And lastly, the uh, incumbent system failed to reproduce and um, uh, fix uh, itself tr during the destabilization process. And there were uh, mainly three different failures. Uh, one of them is that uh, the industry uh, did uh, reduce their investments starting with the 2000s. And uh, the remaining investments uh, mostly focused on less innovative uh, issues, and uh, such as the um, uh, the innovations in, like, the yes, such as the innovations uh, in the conventional uh, conventional power plants. And other than that, uh, the the 
incumbent actors underestimated the transition into renewables, so that's why they did not put uh, much efforts and much resources into the uh, transition of the industry to renewables. And lastly, they did not uh, care about their uh, public image because they were accused of many different issues such as abuse of market power or uh, overcharge of the customers and the bad image of the industry actually accel accelerated their phasing out process. Then I take over to conclude. Um, I also wanted to thank you actually because a lot of us here are studying to understand global transitions and I think this is the very first presentation we hear in such a comprehensive way to understand global transitions. And also I have a focus in innovation and I pretty much trusted Schumpeter's creative destruction to get rid of everything that is not needed anymore. Um, but I already figured that especially concerning infrastructure that will probably not be the case. Um, but we also have some further emerging questions. So the um, paper that we had to analyze actually concluded with a lot of still emerging concepts. It's still an emerging um, sphere of research and um, it was very nice to read it, but still we had like some questions that came up for us and uh, we wanted to talk with you about this. Um, so one would be the geographical scope. Mm -hmm. So which countries could actually contribute a profit from this framework? Um, because currently it's mainly targeted at industrialized countries as you already showed in your tramway mm -hmm. um, uh, example before as well. So I think this would be one uh, of the questions we wanted to raise or also, um, yeah. The other mm -hmm. uh, aspect would be the role of civil societies. I mm -hmm. think you touched it briefly and also in your whole paper you had a look at how right-wing populist parties would emerge, especially out of the sense of being feeling left behind um, due to destabilizing systems. Um, but on the other hand, you also talked about the pressure that is emerging from civic destabilization interventions, like you started your presentations. Um, but in general, um, we just wanted to ask you which role you see for civil society inclusion uh, in the whole destabilization mm -hmm. process as well, especially if you talk about socio-technical systems. Mm -hmm. um, and then another aspect in these emerging questions for us was also the capitalist system. Um, you already talked about incumbent actors, um, but which role would you see for private corporations in uh, this destabilization um, transitions, also regarding to lobbying? Um, mm -hmm. and the resilience as well mm -hmm. of incumbent actors of maybe not complying to what would maybe be necessary out of solidarity or maybe just of better knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so just a question, do you think uh, that just transitions and destabilization can be achieved in the current capitalist system? Small <laughs> question. Know, just a small yeah. question, mm. just some thoughts. Mm. Um, <laughs> and uh, then for the discussion, you also like we want to then open the floor, of course, for the discussion. Um, you also mentioned uh, in some of your former papers that innovation destabilization is strongly correlated. Mm -hmm. And especially if we look at how destabilization can happen and which direction destabilization will take, uh, which role has innovation in this framework? And can it maybe also be of benefit, although it is kind of mm -hmm. sometimes a counter argument. Mm -hmm. And then maybe as well, specifically looking at sustainable transitions. Um, that, uh, of course, the current climate crisis is uh, now very emerging and very evident for all of us. And what do you think that uh, policymakers, and maybe if we want to be policymakers or academia, should take away from this framework? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to go back here to discuss or to answer or how? Back. I need to. Oh, should I need to go back? Okay, okay, okay. Fine. Okay. More than the strong suggestion. Okay. Amazing. Well, uh, firstly, I want to thank you for uh, reading so assiduously. Also, I have to uh, apologize for sending you a. So the paper that I did send at that time to David was a very conceptual paper, much more than the one that I actually ended up presenting today, well, maybe to counterbalance. Um, 
And as you, you know, I mean, I think you prepared this uh, discussion uh, very well. I think you've uh, read very well. They have to. Uh, they, well, they have to. No, but I mean, and, and I should have said, I should have mentioned this uh, earlier. I don't know exactly how uh, your master's program works. David tells me about it every now and then. But, uh, you know, at LISIS, we also happily wel welcome mm -hmm. Uh, uh, master students to do uh, uh, internships or to do uh, 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 research work and so if anyone here is, is interested in this uh, provided is compatible with your program of course uh, you'd be w very welcome to, to uh, get in touch with me to further work on, on a small case or, or some elements uh, of a destabilization case um, so now to your questions. So geographical uh, scope. So transitions frameworks have been criticized for uh, mainly deriving their, um, let's say, their evidence from, uh, at least in, so this field of study is now about 20, 30 years old, um, and deriving most of its evidence from Western countries and even more so European, Western European uh, countries. In the beginning, it was a lot of historical work. Uh, I'm one of the few uh, left doing uh, historical work, which I think is, is still very important, or work on historical cases. Um, so there is clearly a bias. Uh, but we do have a sort of an international research association that's now 3,000, I can't remember now, 3,500 uh, members, the Sustainability Transitions Research Network, STRN. Uh, and there's a number of working groups and in there is a dedicated working group with I think 300, 400 active members working on Global South uh, 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 contexts. So uh, there is reason to believe that there are uh, applications there. I work particularly, I have a PhD student who is looking at the reduction or the difficulties, the, the, the quasi-impossibilities of removing pesticides from agriculture in Senegal in, in vegetable crop uh, production. But there he is obviously uh, uh, very um, uh, inspired by these uh, frameworks and uh, they find them uh, relevant. Um, in the book that you read the chapter of, uh, so this was a book that, you know, these uh, edited volumes, they, we op make an open invitation and then we try to invite also people that we want to contribute to the issue. And I'm very sad that we had uh, a, 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 um, uh, an Indian scholar with an amazing case who in, un, unfortunately could not contribute, but, but this could, because he was just too late and he was busy fighting the political fight uh, of the, the Indian government at the time, uh, the reform, the big uh, uh, reform with a lot of land expropriation. But there his case was, and uh, this is still a relevant case, about um, the destabilization of um, crafts. So not highly complex, uh, uh, modern, let's say, uh, industries, but nonetheless as deeply entrenched industries. Uh, one might say, or he at least would argue, uh, desirable industries that were under threat of destabilization. So that again is, is also an important element of destabilization. Destabilization in a way is just a process that we study. Uh, a politician or an activist might want to harness this process in one way or another, and there can be harmful destabilization as well. I mean, there's always harm in destabilization, but there might be a greater good if, if you're knocking down a, 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 a really harmful system. But destabilization also happens to uh, uh, what may be uh, desirable systems. Another member of our research community, Mark Swilling, uh, was very important in the um, uh, in South Africa in the uh, 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 post-apartheid uh, political struggles and there he uh, really worked as a political judo to change institutions in the front line there and you could look at these kinds of struggles 
not necessarily targeted at industry, but nonetheless structural systems that are reproducing uh, 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 themselves as a form of, of destabilization. Uh, so that leads me then to the second question of the role of, of civil society. I mean, civil society and activism is obviously one of the prime forces of change, positive change, but also change that is pointing out uh, uh, harmful uh, uh, activities, insidious activities, sometimes by industries, sometimes by uh, uh, governments, uh, uh, corruption or, or, or others. So, I mean, a, a first role of civil society in destabilization is as prime actor of pressure, as whistleblower, as uh, 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 alluding and uh, 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 to uh, framing problems and, and making these problems uh, known, uh, enrolling society and uh, politics uh, to address uh, issues. But they can go uh, further as well. Uh, um, uh, voilà. uh, civil society, it depends how you understand civil society. Again, civil society is not necessarily progressive and wonderfully good, mm. you know. Uh, do you consider, and specifically we've seen that uh, very clearly, we, maybe we were ingenious to the idea of civil society in France and, and, and uh, uh, when Macron was elected, he was very clear that he was embarking a government with civil society, but his understanding of civil society was uh, uh, trade and business uh, actors, which is you know, probably legit, it, it, you know, part of civil society as well. But in this environmental and sustainable uh, 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 discussion, we rarely understand them as civil society. So, well, uh, well so again, civil society can play a role in, in whichever uh, direction here. Uh, private corporations, uh, so they can obviously, as incumbents, be at the center of these systems and the victims targets and often they claim to be victims and they might have a, a you know a claim to, to that um, on that relational dimension that I alluded to you know what when industry actors stick together when they're united in a front against regulation they are extremely strong you know? uh, We've seen this, for instance, with the Montreal Protocol, to uh, you know, related to the problem of the ozone uh, 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 hole in the ozone uh, layer. Uh, there's this uh, harmful chemical aerosols of uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbon something, um, and long there was these six or were there seven uh, industry giants resisting any attempt to. Uh, to regulation. I'm not going to do the story now, but eventually they have been resisting for years and years, but at the same time, without anyone really knowing, they were trying to develop a substitute, which would later become hydrochlorofluoro... Mm. <laughs> uh, another substance, less harmful. Uh, and one of the seven came up with this innovation, ready to market it first. And then he broke the alliance, disbanded from the alliance with Dupont Nemours, and that immediately, you know, enabled uh, international regulation. So private corporations play uh, in the nuclear case. So you talked about the German uh, 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 destabilization, uh, energy transition case, and there, of course, in the nuclear side of things, one element that was crucial uh, to enable. Uh, uh, the phase out, the nuclear phase out agenda to get more traction was when Siemens, the main industrial actor there with an interest in German uh, uh, civil uh, nuclear technology, decided, okay, we'll just do something else. And, you know, overnight this changed. Uh, so, so, of course, the powerful actors, the central actors, and likely you cannot change anything without them. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it still needs to be a struggle. Uh, and the last point that I'd like to allude, again related to nuclear. We're discovering now that nuclear phase-out um, agendas and programs are uh, coming along, you know, 
Germany is uh, almost uh, completely uh, 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 decommissioned its, uh, its nuclear reactors. Doesn't mean that it's cleaned it up yet. And we're seeing a huge new industry, the decommissioning of nuclear power plants. It's an, it's an industry largely by, by related actors. Veolia in France has, has a part in this. And they have an extremely stable business model ahead for the next 50 years. They've got hundreds and hundreds of huge nuclear facilities to decommission. They know the age of these structures. They can plan their, you know, their, uh, their strategies. So, you know, phase out also comes with significant opportunities uh, uh, for businesses to get involved. Uh, the role of innovation, uh, that was the last question. I mean, of course, they're tied together. And I always get this question, and I start by saying you know, transition is, is a combination of both, or combinations of both, and they're intricately uh, tied. You cannot study one without looking at the other. But what I suggest, because destabilization phase out is so important and so different, it requires such different analytical skills, but also political skills, that it's worth doing what I call analyt well call with Margaret Archer analytical bracketing. That means, okay, these two things are completely tied and enmeshed, and you know you can't really they're woven together. But just for the sake of analysis, I'm just going to detach them, look specifically at destabilization in depth, and then only go back to studying the linkages, uh, because otherwise everyone's just going to do research about innovation and we'll just not see these more political and contested uh, issues. Okay, and no answer about capitalism? Ah, about capitalism. I didn't even write it down. I didn't even write it down. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... I'm not an expert of capitalism, uh, and I'm not an expert of Marxist reading. I know that one of the core mechanisms uh, is the mechanism of primitive accumulation. The mechanism of primitive accumulation involves uh, the expropriate or taking what is someone else's, whether that is land, whether that is uh, freedom, whether that is work, whether that is skills. And so you can probably see in the process of primitive accumulation some form of destabilization that uh, as a precondition for the development of modern capitalism as well as its expansion uh, uh, today. So that would be a first one. Uh, in, again, Marxist theories that I do not m master and neo-Marxist theories, but I'm socialized with uh, people who do, so I hear a little bit and understand some of it. Um, there's a very particular relationship to crisis in Marxist theory. Um, I'm ambivalent about crisis, and I think I've, I've, I've made that clear, that Crises cannot uh, alone trigger a destabilization and decline process, and more than often, crises are dealt with in ways that either allow a parenthesis to be opened and then immediately closed, or even reinforce the system. Uh, and I think, you know, similarly, uh, uh, Marxist theory suggests that. Capitalism thrives and drives its vital energy from uh, crises. Uh, whether that answers the question, I do not think so. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, no, I'm, can capitalism be destabilized? Is that uh, the question? Um, no, but the, the question was about whether the transition uh, is possible within the capitalist system. I, I, I didn't understand that as an artist's question, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, 
I'm not Marxist myself. I have bits of Marxism, but I'm not sure, and I'm quite unsure that the trans transition can be achieved within a capitalist system. Well, okay, then within a capitalist. I understood it like this, but then I think no, no, I understand that. Uh, that yeah. yeah, probably I, I, I drift a little bit with it. Um, Maybe it's more like the current system. Mm. No, I think, I mean, if you want a one-to-one, -one, uh, like-to-like substitution of feedstocks, that's probably, you know, if you want to substitute uh, renewables for coal, you know, you can do this probably without uh, challenging uh, 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 the current variety of capitalism at, at play in wherever you, you inhabit the world. Uh, but I think you're right to, to suggest that the question becomes a crucial one when considering the justice of transitions. And, I, and I, you know, this is the question of can our transitions opportunities for emancipation? Yes, I think so. Uh, but then it requires addressing uh, 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 these deeper, deeper issues of, of, uh, of who owns. Uh, who will own, who will benefit, who will not benefit. And today, uh, you know, these questions are not even addressed within transition talk in the political uh, realm. Uh, there have been uh, the international labor unions getting more and more interested uh, since the end of the 90s. Until then, they were just protecting work at whatever cost, labor employment at whatever cost. And, and, and they have become interested in the question of, of reskilling workers and actually not necessarily only resisting uh, uh, environmental pressure. Uh, voilà. But, uh, yes? A classical Marxist proposition would be that technology is shaped by class power. And that applies for current socio-technical systems, uh, just as for future socio-technical systems, such as, uh, like, these are like the pitfalls of the green transition, right? Uh, for example, to use uh, agriculture to uh, cultivate biofuels, to uh, indulge in pipe dreams of green hydrogen mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. instead of just building up renewables. How, uh, what, do you, like, what do you see right now how like, class power can shape the green transition? Mm. So for instance, in agriculture in France, we have uh, this important but not incumbent, in, important counter power uh, uh, that one could say is a, you know, is a, is a, is a union, a radical union for uh, farming, a confédération paysanne, yeah. uh, which uh, tries to struggle against, in political uh, uh, struggles, against the mainstream visions that are largely held by uh, uh, official policy and the large uh, lobby of the FNSEA, um, the conventional agricultural lobby, and they're struggling. They are struggling in that struggle, and <laughs> they're struggling to make their voice heard. They're struggling on the ground uh, to win over uh, on specific issues and regulation. For instance, the, the issue of uh, of uh, cross-contamination of neighboring fields uh, by pesticide use, leakage. Uh, they're struggling, they're not being heard, or at least they are being heard, but this is not being translated. But the other issue they're, they're struggling with is numbers. Confédération Paysanne can, can, can be uh, arguing and contesting as much as it wants. If no one of us younger people wants to become a farmer, you know, they're representation becomes or remains small as it is you know uh, but I mean, I mean transitions are not to be thought of in tech and this is why importantly socio-technical uh, it's not about coal or nuclear or it's about what kind it's about what kind of agriculture uh, and uh, and and indeed I think an objective in itself, a transition objective could be avoiding co-optation and captation by, uh, by uh, powerful interests. Many questions, a sea of questions. Yeah, yeah. so um, now you can proceed as you wish. So either you take question by question, 
No. Or you take a wave but of questions, and then we have please ask you to introduce yourself. Okay. And your uh, name and country. Hmm? Hello, my name is Leonard, I'm from Germany, and I was wondering because uh, the case study that you presented there, the, like the vectors of power were already pointing into the same direction, kind of, like the destabilization was, in, was favored by politicians and the industry alike, kind of, and I was wondering how you would answer to the question, if we're now today facing upward uh, hit hill battles, like let's say facing uh, the fossil fuel industry, where would you see um, us, like as next year we will all have to find work, what is the good um, or the most effective position for us to be in to create these kind of destabilizations with respect to certain um, regimes such as the fossil fuel regime or uh, the growth based economy, stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Kara. I'm from Austria. Uh, I would like to go back to the uh, point that our colleague mentioned about the populism argument and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more and that if, if I understood that correctly or again it was only mentioned uh, that if we would overcome this period of destabilization if this could also reverse the trends we're seeing. Is that like an argument like if we overcome this period of destabilization or handle it well as policymakers whatsoever that we could also see the reverse and not always like rising votes in right-wing populist parties or do you think there's something completely else needed or is there a connection? Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Dario from Italy. My question is just about the framework it doesn't uh, concern political issues. I, I wonder how do we consider in this framework the possibility that destabilization processes can lead neither to radical change or marginal change of the system, but to the coexistence and the parallel surviving of multiple mm -hmm. uh, systems. I have many examples in my head, mm -hmm. but I skip those. Uh, if it's clear, like is this considered only a moment of the transition, or it can be considered even the very conclusion mm -hmm. of the of the process? So the multiple equilibrium, the multiple mm -hmm. coexistence. There's a last one here, I think. Maybe I'll stop to four. Hello, I'm Bjarne from Germany. Uh, relating also a little bit to Kara's question about uh, populist uh, structures, I have a very specific example in mind where I would like to hear your opinion on. Um, so regarding the coal transition in Germany, which is kind of underway right now, pretty late compared to other European countries. And there we see strong political opposition in specific regions, similar to how it is in the US, uh, mm -hmm. for example and how they try to overcome this political opposition, which is also kind of a justice question. Like, are, do you have any examples where it is possible to persuade opposition to support the transition? Do some transitions have to be forced through against a minority, but a significant minority? In Germany, they tried it with large, uh, um, money gifts basically so for about 11,000 jobs they invest um, about 40 billion euros which is an extraordinary amount but it doesn't seem to persuade anyone everyone is still against the transition so I'm wondering what can be done and can it be done Tough question. Good luck. All right. Good luck. Uh, thank you Hello. Um, no, but uh, that's too much now. No, no, I stopped at four and for now. And I have another way. Okay. Keep the mic. So, where is the best place to do destabilization in practice at work? Uh, okay. And it relates to one of the questions that was from the discussants as well. I mean, if if it depends what work is in, in a. Industry uh, work, uh, I think, you know, destabilizing a company from within is probably not in your job description. 
you know, <laughs> is not really compatible with your uh, uh, employment contract. Uh, you can become a whistleblower, but you know that comes with significant radical change in your life and your employment possibilities later on. Uh, but in policy, if work is policy, uh, something I didn't mention, but I believe very strongly, and I mean the last question uh, relates to this, uh, destabilization as opposed to innovation policy, destabilization policy as opposed to innovation policy is inherently more place-based. There are specific sectors and regions that we can expect to become exposed uh, or hit more hard by destabilization pressure. Now that's a bit different with agriculture because our agriculture tends to be more insidious. But uh, uh, you know, the coal in, in Germany is not anywhere. It's in a specific. So it becomes regional policy. Okay. Um, I sit on a UN, uh, so United Nations Environmental Program, and I've been charged to write a chapter on transformation. And, and there, uh, one of the lead um, scientific advisors is Bob Watson, who is president of IBES. And he is adamant that the main problem, and he says this in plenaries of the UN, you know, and that's new, we didn't see this five years ago, that the main problem today is vested interests and stranded assets. Okay? So this issue is not just in our imagination. You know? It exists. It, okay, how will it be handled? Another question, but it exists. And so I'm in this context uh, asked to provide some sort of rudimentary uh, guidance for how can we sit, think through these problems. And so I, I ended up making a a two by two matrix, there are new systems that might be desirable that you might want to support. Do that. That's a policy domain. It's innovation, desirable innovation. There are existing systems that are harmful that you might want to phase out. That would be phase out and that's what we talked about. There are new systems developing potentially that we know will be harmful. Space travel, the further development of SUVs or whatever, you know, that also requires some preemptive uh, uh, destabilization. There's a lot of policy work to be done uh, in these uh, areas. And of course, there are existing desirable systems that are constantly under threat of being dismantled. Health systems, for instance, uh, today, public health systems. And they need also from within active protection and maintenance. So you know, all of that gives a lot of work for at least those of you who work to work in policy. And also it's very, it's, it's more proximate, closer type of policy. I mentioned the UN, but I think it's the work has to be done at, at, at regional and local uh, level. The rise, uh, reverse destabilization and the rise in uh, populism. Uh, okay, we are seeing, um, Again, I'm way out of my depth here, uh, but we are seeing a rise in populism. It's not me saying that, it's a, a political scientists and specifically those that work with a, a geographical uh, uh, element, uh, comparative element. They say, they, tend to, they say that they tend to find more populism in those regions left behind. Okay, Left behind by what, by whom, by, you know, I don't, you know. Um, so that might be a, a starting. To, it would be interesting. I mean, I don't have an answer, but maybe the following question is, are these region, well, these regions left behind are probably left, some of them are left behind because of a historical destabilization process. Can we learn? Was it a particularly badly handled destabilization process? Can we learn from that to make that less badly Handled. As far as I'm concerned, what I know of the British coal destabilization, it's a textbook worst case scenario. You know, uh, you want to destroy communities, you can't do it better than than in that way. Well, uh, so at least in that sense, we have a raisonnement par l'absurde. Um, 
Voilà, and destabilization and coexistence. Uh, yeah, I mean, the destabilization is just a process. It's a context, and it can have different outcomes, some of which I've suggested, you know, full decline of a system, a partial decline of a system, our friend uh, Jean-Baptiste Fressos would say that systems never decline. He would say actually transitions don't e exist. Uh, things just displace themselves, you know. If we're not extracting the coal in Europe anymore, it's being extracted somewhere else. Uh, well, uh, which is also a relevant uh, view if you're flexible with your analytical uh, units. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, places where multiple systems with different rationalities coexist. Um, the question of agriculture is a very interesting one. So, specifically with pesticides. So we see now since the 50s claims to end pesticides, very minority claims to end pesticides, um, that have been gradually, since the 70s, 80s, 90s, brought into policy agendas to regulate pesticides, to provide a horizon for reduction of pesticides use in agriculture, obviously not uh, one that uh, activists are happy with, nonetheless some uh, movements forwards, um, but at the same time you have entire communities of alternative farming that have set up themselves outside of uh, conventional farming uh, as you know a place where they find more hope and more uh, 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 dynamism. Then there's the question of how do they interact because on the fringes they do interact and concerning this uh, long-term ending horizon for pesticides in agriculture, at least in Europe. Uh, it's pretty sad days uh, for the last uh, uh, 10 days where we had, have seen this 40-year this, this gradual movement towards making pesticide removal more of a possibility, now being reversed with a, a complete reversal of fortune in, in, in Strasbourg uh, uh, now 10 days ago. Voilà, so I think that's the four questions. I can take so another, I don't know if we... time for another short way. Uh, so you had a question, don't forget to introduce yourself. Here comes the second wave. Um, I'm Linda from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in um, kind of the political debate about the transitions that could be possible, because I like that you mentioned that there's not one way that this destabilization can occur. So I'm wondering, do you know in your field of any, any theories of um, democracy in destabilization, destabilizing regimes? Like how do, we, um, how do we have a democratic debate about which phase out we desire? Because I feel like now this is a discussion that is maybe happening in rooms like this between experts but it's not a, a popular conversation that we're having yet. So I was wondering if you know anybody working in this part. Okay, so there's a... Um, Wait, maybe first we need uh, uh, yeah, like a to few, finish a the wave. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Yaksh, I'm from India. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about uh, the pesticide project in, oh, sorry, the culture um, industry project, the craft industry project uh, that you described in India. Um, and somewhat on a tangent, but there's also the case of energy transition in India, uh, where hydropower is really being promoted. And that comes with a huge cost of displacing our indigenous um, population and there's a huge discourse around it um, within the indigenous community and the alternative movement in India because they're opposing hydropower as renewable because it's really not sustainable. Uh, it comes with huge human costs. Mm -hmm. um, but they have still gone ahead with it and now 20 years into that transition, uh, dams that were built by clearing out forests are breaking apart. They're meeting with accidents because quality was compromised. It was a huge IMF involvement in the financing of these projects. I was wondering if you could also maybe share what you think about displacements that 
actually do happen, but um, come at huge costs, which, I mean, they're advertised as something that can be sustainable, but mm -hmm. they're actually not. Hello, so my Hi. name is Stefan and I'm from Denmark. So uh, like many of my other people in this room, they're probably following what's happening in Dubai right now. And uh, there's been a new word, uh, at least in my vocabulary, and, that's n and that is face down. So I wanted to hear your ideas about uh, this new concept. And I also wanted to hear about the, the new uh, damages and the mitigation fund that's been created there. And if you have any ideas about this in the destabilization thing. Good luck again. <laughs> they're, they're good students. Well, don't worry. I'm not going to take you to court for this. So this is just uh, an informal question. So we have 10 minutes. We call it that. So if you don't mind, I suggest to stop the questions here. Because you need time. It would, it would require many dissertations. It would, it would, but maybe there are some dissertations to be written uh, yeah, sure. uh, there would. by the proprietors of the, of the, of the, of the questions, exactly. Uh, so, transitions that could be possible and in the intersection between questions of transitions and question of transitions of democracy. Again, I'm not a special, I should have put um, I should have sent, maybe I'll send uh, this to, to uh, your course conveners and it can be sent around there. Uh, in 2019, uh, there was a relatively collaboratively written uh, research agenda paper within the transitions uh, research community uh, that pinpointed, that looked at 20 years of history and upcoming themes. And uh, one of them is obviously the question of power uh, and politics, uh, wherein such questions can be uh, discussed. Uh, another one is the question of just transitions, uh, where uh, obviously questions of democracy, but maybe through uh, the, well, the, prism, the various prisms of, of justice are uh, discussed. Justice, envir well, environmental justice, I find extremely confusing. I'm not saying that means it shouldn't be uh, uh, discussed. I think it's a central issue, but there is a proliferation of framings. There's at least 10, maybe 12 frameworks existing around there, uh, procedural justice, environmental justice, social justice, etc., 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 intergenerational justice. And so it's very confusing. I mean, it's a question in itself. I think... Um, one where I could say maybe a little bit more, it was about the question of representation, uh, political representation. Um, so the first question is whose transition is this? Uh, who decides the direction and then the means of travel? Um, and essential to that is who sits in the room. You know, you alluded to expert, but there's also uh, a lot of influence uh, um, being uh, weighing on these decisions. Uh, these decisions are never, you know, it's a longitudinal process. It's a really complicated thing. No one has a recipe. I mean, even if you, you know, even if you were in an autocracy uh, with all uh, supreme powers and ability to plan uh, uh, with, you know, uh, uh, five yearly plans with total control, you would not be able to plan a transition uh, uh, swiftly. Uh, so it is a very complex uh, thing, it is a moving target, but the question of who sits in the room and who arbitrates at various uh, points in time is essential. And so uh, for this reason, uh, knowing what transitions are, trying to formalize our knowledge about them, trying to understand how they can be evaluated uh, as 
sort of processes, but also in terms of their implications, their redistributive implications, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are uh, are necessary if we even want to go in that uh, direction in a in a rather controlled uh, way. Uh, you know, there's a, this uh, book. I mean, the social sociology of science and technology has looked a lot at how collectively we build instrumentations to know the world uh, and and you know for instance in the world of climate we have scientists have gradually standardized the way that they uh, generate and uh, and uh, and um, and harmonize their uh, research findings to come to a rather uh, coherent and consensual understanding about the climate is changing, how it is changing, at what speed is it changing, uh, uh, what might be the consequences, etc. So that's in working group one of, 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 uh, of the IPCC. Now these questions of transitions are now only starting to be uh, discussed uh, with serious, uh, under, you know, with, with some knowledge of the mechanisms behind within working group three of the IPCC. And so we're far, far away from having even a glimpse of, of how we would actually measure these things. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, not try. Uh, and I think we should. I think it's, it's, it's essential, essential. Uh, and that might point to a lot of disagreement. And I think really the main point is transitions are inherently political. They're nothing, I mean, pri primarily political. Then the rest is, you know, engineering and, and, uh, and coordination issues and whatever. They're primarily political. Uh, on uh, the Indian cases, uh, so and I mentioned that because I, I have no knowledge of these cases. I've had a number of, of discussions with a colleague, uh, Dinesh Abrol, uh, uh, and he is very knowledgeable about this. Unfortunately, I, I, I was very willing to read about it, but he, he never got to, uh, to, to, um, to find time to submit his, his work on, on craft culture. Uh, there's obviously a... a very intense processes of infrastructure building and various forms of modernization going on that are uh, uh, very challenging, uh, that are uh, infringing on uh, the rights of individual uh, people. Um, uh, I know that, for instance, in India, there's this whole uh, national health identity uh, uh, card that is, uh, that is, you know, dramatic in its, in its implications. Um, uh, dams have always come with significant local environmental damage, local, not just uh, punctual, but, you know, all along uh, the course of, of, uh, uh, of rivers uh, upstream and downstream as you modify the environment. Um, you know, I'm not sure this is a question for destabilization. It's a question for infrastructure. And infrastructure uh, <laughs> projects always come with, with, with very tense uh, local issues. When France uh, developed its nuclear uh, park, uh, uh, massively rolling it out in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, there were quite heated discussions about where do you put the power station. Power station had to be close to water because you need cooling. Usually fresh water more than, than but there's a couple on the on the sea. Uh, they had to be close enough, but not too close to large urban centers, uh, primarily for the transport of of electricity, and not too close so as to not uh, uh, um, uh, create too much disturbance. But you also see that uh, while the first projects were rather uh, uh, sort of encountered with some enthusiasm, you know, it was still this modern thing that was going to bring economic uh, windfall, etc., and irrigate the communities uh, locally. As problems really beca began in the mainstream with nuclear uh, power uh, in the 80s, uh, local towns uh, and, you know, communities that would receive these projects became 
more and more hesitant. And uh, in a way, uh, the price to pay for the utilities uh, became higher. Uh, wonderful rugby clubs, uh, wonderful uh, school facilities uh, in the towns that have received uh, nuclear power stations. You know, it is, you know, basically some form of indirect corruption uh, going on with uh, uh, taxes and windfalls and, and adaptations of, of, of frameworks here. Uh, I can't say much more, but uh, uh, you did mention sustainable. I think you're using sustainable in a little bit of a, as a, I would argue, maybe think sustainable, and there are multiple forms of sustainability, uh, temporal and and, uh, uh, and and in terms of the object, but uh, but other qualifier fires that are relevant, uh, sustainable, um, desirable, uh, viable, uh, consensual, all of these come in the balance of of uh, of political decisions to for citing. Uh, that, so that will be my very partial answer to this. Uh, phase down uh, and phase out and phase down. Well, you know, we can both read. Um, out is out, down is down. <laughs> no, but I mean, more seriously, there's, I mean, the semantics of climate talk are essential. And they're essential specifically if you have sat in these rooms and seen the work going on in corrections, the headaches, the nightmares. And so this is not a benign choice of word. That means that the horizon is not stopping. The horizon is reducing a little. Uh, and and uh, and that is scary, and I think we are seeing. And unfortunately, I think uh, you know environmental activism has to wake up a little bit uh, because uh, we have taken for granted that a path a path was charted, a history of future of environmental improvement. Uh, you know, after the victories, the relative victories of the 80s and. 90s, you know, getting the issue mainstreamed. There was, I think there is a belief in, and many of us are now in rather disbelief and seeing very strong backlash, uh, potential for reversal, uh, and, and the, the, the basis of environmental uh, improvement have not, are not safeguarded at all. Um, and so, it is scary, and I think it is a moment to put the pressure on, uh, would be my point. And on damages and losses, it's a difficult one. There's a very nice paper by Rebecca Elliott on the sociology of loss. So she's a sociologist, she, she says, in 2021, I think. Uh, we should stop asking ourselves what, as sociologists, we can do about the climate. We should start asking ourselves, what does the climate do to us? And so she argues then that, uh, you know, we should be interested in loss because, you know, it's quite clear that uh, it's no longer about addressing the climate issue only. It's also about living with changing climate and living with the losses that, that come with it. Um, um, and this gradual slippage from, you know, a, a two-headed uh, climate discussions with mitigation on one hand and adaptation on the other. It took quite a while to get the adaptation question on the table already. And now this adaptation question is morphing into a sort of insurance-based forms of, of, uh, of uh, financial mechanisms, uh, which it's not clear. I don't have a clear reading. You could read it in many ways, uh, but I think one of the ways uh, is that uh, countries from the Northern Hemisphere are also saying, we're going to lose uh, something here. 
So um, it's an extension, I think, of the adaptation questions uh, to the entire world. And uh, I, I, yeah, it's hard. I'm, I'm not sure I see where this is going. I don't have a crystal ball. Okay. Bravo.